happy birthday, my son. If only I could have helped you. Nick Adenhart was born on August 24, 1986, in Silver Spring, Maryland. A baseball star from a young age, Nick was projected by scouts to be a first-round draft pick in the 2004 player draft. However, the right-handed pitcher's stock plummeted after he suffered an injury in his last high school game that would result in Tommy John surgery. He would end up being selected late in the draft by the Angels, and went on to make his major league debut with the team four years later. He earned his only big league decision on May 12, 2008, a win against the White Sox in Anaheim. After spending more time in the minor leagues in 2008, Adenhart became the Angels' top prospect heading into 2009. He earned a spot as a third starter in the club's rotation, but only appeared in one game, a no decision on April 8th. Just a few hours after this game, Adenhart was the victim of a hit and run by a drunk driver and died at the age of 22. A devastated Angels team made great efforts to honor their fallen teammate. For the rest of the 2009 season, the Angels wore jerseys that featured black patches with Aiden Hart's number 34. Nick's locker at Angel Stadium remained as it was for the rest of the season, and a locker continued to be assigned to him for road games. Mike Napoli, who caught Aiden Hart's final game, was known to go out to center field before games to write Nick's initials in the warning track dirt. Angel Stadium's center field fence was adorned with a black and white photo of Nick, and in one of the more memorable events of the 2009 season, the entire Angels team went out to his shrine for a picture with him after clinching the American League West. Though his playing career was cut short, Aiden Hart brought together the 2009 Angels, one of the best teams in the franchise's history. In 2013, Jared Weaver, Nick's teammate, named his first child Aiden in honor of his late friend. Symbol for Nick behind his number there. A right-handed starting pitcher from Southern California, Daryl Kyle enjoyed a stellar career with three teams. Born December 2, 1968, Kyle would make his Major League debut on April 8, 1991 with the Houston Astros. In his first Major League start, Kyle took a no-hitter into the sixth inning before being pulled in order to protect his arm. He would eventually author a no-hitter on September 8, 1993, the last no-hitter ever thrown at the Astrodome. Known for his sharp breaking curve, Ball, Kyle became an All-Star, a 20-game winner, a Cy Young contender, and a postseason competitor in his career. He pitched in his last game on June 18, 2002, helping his team, the Cardinals, move to first place in the NL Central. On June 22, Kyle was discovered dead in his hotel room in Chicago after suffering a heart attack. A grieving Cardinals team postponed their scheduled game and made efforts to honor their fallen teammate. A sign reading DK57 was installed in the Cardinals' bullpen and later carried over to their new stadium, where it remains today. In the 2002 All-Star Game, teammate Matt Morris wrote DK57 on his hands and held them up when they announced his name. After the Cardinals clinched the NL Central, Albert Pujols carried Kyle's jersey during the team's celebration. Since his death, Daryl's teams have not assigned his number 57 to any other player. And in 2003, the Daryl Kyle Good Guy Award was announced, which honors players from the Astros and Cardinals who best exhibit Kyle's qualities of being a great teammate, a great friend, and a humble man. With an assembly of pitches at his disposal, lefty Joe Kennedy proved to be an effective utility pitcher, spending time both as a starter and reliever with five teams in the 2000s. The multi-sport star from La Mesa, California, made his Major League debut in 2001 with Tampa Bay, becoming the first lefty to start for the team in more than 200 games. The following season, he threw an impressive five complete games with 109 strikeouts for a last place team. In 2004, his first full year with Colorado, Kennedy became the Rockies' first ever starting pitcher to have an ERA below 4. The next few seasons, he would play with Oakland, Arizona, and Toronto before becoming a free agent. On November 23, 2007, while staying in Florida for a wedding, Kennedy collapsed in the middle of the night and was taken to a nearby hospital, where he was pronounced dead. Weeks later, it was revealed that the 28-year-old had passed away due to a hypertensive heart disease. Following his death, former teammate and future Hall of Fame Frank Thomas kept Kennedy's glove in his locker until his retirement from baseball.
a member of the Cleveland Indians Hall of Fame, Chapman is most well known today for being the only major leaguer to die from an injury received during a major league game. This injury occurred on August 16, 1920, when he was struck in the head by a pitch from Yankees starter Carl Mays at the Polo Grounds. This was long before the days of helmets or even strict rules to pitchers scuffing and dirtying up the baseball. Mays unleashed a submarine delivery to no reaction from Chapman, who was likely unable to even see the pitch. The sound of the ball striking Chapman was so loud that Mays believed it had struck his bat, prompting him to pick it up and fire it at first base. Ray was taken off the field to a nearby hospital, where he died early the next morning. His pregnant wife was summoned to New York and collapsed upon hearing the news of his death. Thousands attended Ray's funeral in Cleveland, and the Indians wore black armbands for the remainder of the season in his honor. Although he is most remembered for the circumstances surrounding his death, Ray Chapman's playing career is not to be overlooked. He was the American League leader in walks and runs scored in 1918, and remains near the top of the all-time sacrifice hits list with 334. Chapman was one of the premier defenders of his era, leading American League shortstops in putouts three times and assists once. Quick around the base paths, his 52 stolen bases in 1917 set a team record that stood for 63 years. He was one of the few players that Ty Cobb considered a friend. Born in 1873 in Northeast Indiana, Chick Stahl would earn a fearsome reputation on the baseball diamond. One of the most consistent batters of his era, Stahl was a career 305 hitter and an instrumental part of the Boston Americans' 1903 World Series championship, the first modern World Series title. Before the beginning of the Americans' 1907 season, Stahl was named player manager of his club, but stresses related to the job caused him to resign from the position in favor of being a player. He appeared in good spirits after this decision. On March 28th, during the team's spring training, Stahl committed suicide after drinking four ounces of carbolic acid. Jimmy Collins, Stahl's teammate, was there to hear his last words. I couldn't help it. I did it, Jim. It was killing me and I couldn't stand it, Jim. Though Stahl had entertained ideas of self-destructive behavior to his teammates and friends before, the circumstances surrounding his suicide remain a mystery. What exactly it was remains unknown to this day. Stahl and other teammates are mentioned in the popular song Tessie by the Dropkick Murphys. Tessie echoed April through October nights after serenading Stahl, Deneen, and Young. Jim Umbricht was born on September 17, 1930, in Chicago, Illinois. He was a multi-sport star at his high school in Atlanta, and would become captain of the baseball and basketball teams at his college. After spending many years in the minor leagues and even some time in the Army, Umbricht earned a spot as a relief pitcher in the Pirates organization in 1959. Although he began his career in Pittsburgh, Jim is best remembered for his time spent with the Houston Astros franchise. He was selected by the Astros, then known as the Colt 40 in the 1961 expansion draft. With the Colts, the righty Umbricht earned a reputation as one of the best relief pitchers in the National League. Before the 1963 season, Umbricht was diagnosed with malignant melanoma, a type of skin cancer, in his right leg. Despite persistent pain in his leg after having the cancer removed, Umbricht continued with his career and was still regarded as one of the top tier relievers in baseball. By the end of the 63 season, Umbricht's cancer had come back and was more severe. In the coming months, it spread to his chest area and was deemed uncurable. In his final months, Umbricht spent time playing golf and attending ceremony dinners in his honor. He finally succumbed to the disease on April 8, 1964, the day before Houston's season began. To honor their late teammate, the Colts wore black armbands throughout the 64 season. In 1965, Houston retired his number 32, making him the 12th player in baseball history to have a jersey number retired. Umbricht is a member of the Houston Houston Astros Hall of Fame, alongside other legends like Nolan Ryan, Craig Biggio, and Jeff Bagwell. Known for his fiery competitiveness on the field, starting pitcher Jordano Ventura was an essential part of the Kansas City Royals' successes in the 2010s. A hard-throwing right-hander from the Dominican Republic, Ventura's fastball routinely reached speeds of 100 miles an hour, topping out at 102. In four big league seasons, Jordano threw two complete games and struck out 150 batters twice. He is perhaps best remembered for his pitching performances in the postseason, helping Kansas City to two American League pennants 
Pirates and the city's first World Series title in 30 years. In the postseason, Ventura had six games with five or more innings pitched and three or fewer runs given up. His most memorable performance was Game 6 of the 2014 World Series, a win or go home for the Royals. Prior to this game, Ventura had etched Rest in Peace OT number 18 on his cap to honor Oscar Tavares, a fellow major leaguer, friend, and countryman of Ventura who died in a car crash at the age of 22 just two days prior. Ventura earned the win that night in Oscar's memory. Sadly, Jordano would meet the same fate as his friend. On January 22nd, 2017, at the age of 25, Ventura died in a car crash in the Dominican. The Royals honored him by wearing patches that read Ace Number 30 throughout the 2017 season. Regarded as the left-handed hitting Vladimir Guerrero, Oscar Tavares, the player Jordano Ventura honored in the 2014 World Series, was one of the most exciting young talents in baseball at the time of his death. The right fielder from the Dominican Republic homered in his Major League debut, and he quickly gained a reputation as a consistent contact hitter. Oscar had a contact rate of 92.3% on pitches outside of the strike zone, far above the Major League average. Tavares played 80 games with the Cardinals in 2014 the only major league season of his career. He is perhaps best remembered for hitting a game-tying home run in Game 2 of the NLCS, the Cardinals' only postseason win against the Giants in 2014. After being eliminated from the playoffs, Tavares returned to the Dominican. On October 26, he and his girlfriend died in a car accident after driving while intoxicated. A grieving Cardinals organization honored him by turning on the right field lights at Bush Stadium and pledging to better educate their young players on avoiding reckless actions. The Cardinals featured patches bearing Oscar's initials the following season. Tavares' funeral was held in his home province of Puerto Plata. His teammate Carlos Martinez said, He was like Superman here. He was here to uplift kids and put the town on the map. He was the hope. More than 5,000 people were estimated in attendance, with mourners wearing jerseys that read, El Fenomeno. Ross Youngs was born in Shiner, Texas in 1897. Despite receiving scholarships to play college football, Youngs opted to pursue a career in baseball instead, eventually catching the attention of the New York Giants organization. Renowned Giants manager John McGraw grew a strong liking to Youngs and called him one of the greatest players he had ever seen. It was McGraw who gave him the nickname Pep because of his hustle. Pep would join the Giants late in 1917, getting nine hits in his first seven games. In 1918, his true rookie season, Youngs played right field and finished near the top in the National League in many major offensive categories. From that point on, Youngs' career kept going up. He compiled 200 hits in a season twice, scored more than 100 runs three times, and hit better than 300 in a full season seven times. Ross hit for the cycle on April 29, 1922, becoming the fifth giant to do so in the modern era. In the postseason, he helped his team to two world championships in 1921 and 1922. In Game 3 of the 1921 World Series, Youngs became the first player to get two hits in the same inning of a World Series game. Ross's career would be met with trouble in 1926 after he was diagnosed with a kidney disorder. He fell too ill to play on August 10th of that year and eventually succumbed to the disease on October 22nd, 1927, at the age of 30. The Giants honored him with a plaque at the polo grounds, paid for entirely by fan donations. A true Giants legend, Youngs was a favorite player of John McGraw and even taught Mel Ott, his successor, to play right field. Youngs was included on the inaugural balloting of the Hall of Fame in 1936, but fell short. He was eventually elected by means of the Veterans Committee in 1972. One of the most promising young talents in recent memory, Jose Fernandez was born July 31, 1992, in Santa Clara, Cuba. Jose grew up loving baseball and even played on the same youth team as future star Aledmis Diaz. After his stepfather defected from Cuba in 2005, Fernandez made efforts to do the same. After three unsuccessful defection attempts, Jose finally escaped into Mexico with his mother and sister at the age of 15. This journey was not without danger 
passengers. At one point, turbulent waters had knocked a passenger out of the boat. Fernandez's instincts told him to dive into the pitch black water to save this passenger from drowning. To his surprise, it was his mother who he had saved. Jose would eventually end up in Tampa and continued a career in baseball. He was drafted by the Florida Marlins in 2011 and made his major league debut with the team in 2013. Jose exploded onto the baseball scene and enjoyed one of the greatest rookie pitching seasons in history. He sported a 2.19 ERA and finished third in NL Cy Young voting. He considered his grandmother, Olga, the love of his life and the two were reunited after this season. Although his pitching was stellar, Fernandez is perhaps best remembered for his infectious personality, always smiling and keeping positive around his teammates and competitors. He was enjoying his second All-Star season in 2016 and already set a new club record with 253 strikeouts. On September 25th, Fernandez and two friends were killed in a boating accident in Miami Beach, Florida. Jose's death was met with sorrow throughout the baseball world as teams around the league paid tribute to him with a moment of silence. The Marlins, heavy with grief, would honor Fernandez the following day in a game against the Mets. All players wore his jersey and earned an emotional win for their fallen teammate. Born in Akron, Ohio on June 7, 1947, Thurman Munson was the fourth overall pick in the 1968 MLB Draft. The first Yankees captain since Lou Gehrig, Munson was regarded as the heart and soul of the team. He was named Rookie of the Year in 1970 after hitting 302 in 132 games with New York, making 80 assists as catcher. The following year, he made his first All-Star appearance and became a reputable catcher, making only one error all season. while catching 61% of base dealers. Thurman's one error, by the way, came on a home plate collision in which he was knocked unconscious and the ball was dislodged from his glove. Making a name for himself in an era of other stellar catchers, Munson captured three gold glove awards and became the first catcher since Bill Dickey to have three straight seasons with a 300 average and 100 runs batted in. A clutch competitor who hit 357 in the postseason, Thurman led New York to two World Series titles, even catching the final out of the 1978 Fall Classic. The captain tied a record in 1976 with six consecutive hits in the World Series. That same year, he was named American League MVP after hitting 302 with 105 RBIs. Munson had learned to fly airplanes during his career and was said to have above average skills and judgment as a pilot. On August 2nd, 1979, Munson got into an accident while practicing taking off and landing at Akron Canton Airport in Ohio and died. Two friends were in the plane with him and survived. They later said that Thurman's calmness during the situation led to their survival. The day after his death, the Yankees had a heartwarming pregame ceremony in which all starters stood at their defensive positions with the exception of the catcher's box. It was left empty for their fallen teammate. Some 51,000 fans burst into an eight-minute standing ovation following a prayer and performance of America the Beautiful. The entire Yankees team attended Munson's funeral on August 6th, and George Steinbrenner retired his number 15 immediately following his death. In 1980, a plaque of him was placed in the Yankees' Monument Park, and his locker was never reassigned for the rest of Yankee Stadium's tenure. Thurman's impact on New York City is also written on a one-block street in the Bronx called Thurman Munson Way. Miguel Fuentes' major league career lasted only eight games. The right-handed pitcher from Puerto Rico played with the Seattle Pilots during the last month of the 1969 season. On January 29, 1970, Fuentes was shot and killed outside of a bar in Luisa Aldea, Puerto Rico. Because of the team's subsequent move to Milwaukee the following season, Fuentes holds the distinction of throwing the last pitches in Seattle Pilots history.
A World Series champion, right-handed pitcher Bob Moose spent his 10-year career with a Pittsburgh Pirates dynasty that captured five NL East titles. Moose had a handful of great seasons with Pittsburgh, but his best year was 1969, when he garnered a career-high 14 wins, 2.91 ERA, and a Major League Best 8.24 winning percentage. On September 20th of that year, he no-hit the New York Mets, the world champions to be. Moose died in an automobile accident on his 29th birthday in 1976, just two weeks after his last pitching performance. A hard-throwing right-hander from Compton, California, Don Wilson spent his entire nine-year MLB career with the Houston Astros. Playing with the club during their early years, Wilson's successes established him as one of the all-time Astros greats. In 1967, his first full year with the club, Wilson threw a no-hitter against the Atlanta Braves, striking out 15 and blanking a lineup that included the likes of Hank Aaron and Felipe Alou. It was the first no-hitter ever thrown at a domed stadium, or on artificial turf. On July 14th, 1968, Wilson set a team record that still stands today, after striking out 18 batters in one game. In 1969, Wilson was involved in one of the more unique occurrences in baseball history. On April 30th, his team was no-hit by Cincinnati Reds pitcher Jim Maloney. It was the second no-no of his career. Though defeated, Houston came back the following day with Wilson on the bump. He returned the favor by no-hitting the Reds for his second no-hitter, becoming only the 16th player to fire two in his career. Wilson finished the 69 season strong. He helped the Astros to their first ever 500 season with a career-best 16 wins. His team also set a major league record for most strikeouts by a pitching staff with 1,221. Wilson led his team with 235 Ks on the year. In 1971, Don was selected to the All-Star Game, the only appearance of his career, throwing a scoreless 7th and 8th. On September 20th, 1974, Don pitched the last game of his career, tossing a two-hit shutout against the Braves. On January 5th, 1975, Don was found dead at the age of 29 at his home in Houston. Although certain details surrounding his death are unclear, a generally accepted theory is that Don had driven home while intoxicated. He parked in his garage, which was attached to his house, then activated the garage door closer before passing out. His vehicle, still running, released carbon monoxide that fatally asphyxiated him. Even more tragic, the emissions also took the life of his five-year-old son Alex, who was sleeping above the garage. Don's wife and daughter were treated at the hospital and survived the accident. To honor Wilson, the Astros retired his number 40 and later adopted black patches on their uniforms with his number. A right-handed submariner out of Oregon, Steve Oland enjoyed four seasons as a reliever with the Cleveland Indians before his untimely death. On March 23, 1993, Steve and teammates Tim Cruz and Bob Ojeda were boating on a lake in Claremont, Florida during an off day in the Indian spring training. An intoxicated Cruz then crashed the boat, resulting in his death as well as Steve's. Bob Ojeda sustained serious injuries but survived the ordeal. Olin, who was 27, had just come off his best season, saving 29 games with Cleveland with a 2.34 ERA. To honor both Steve and his teammate, the Indians wore patches with their numbers during the 1993 season. One of Steve's favorite songs was The Dance by Garth Brooks. When Cleveland clinched the American League Central in 1995, this song was played over the stadium speakers, leading to teary-eyed teammates who remembered their fallen friend. Born in 1950 in Birmingham, Alabama, Lyman Bostock was the son of a Negro League first baseman. At an early age, he took interest in baseball, but after his righty glove was stolen, Bostock had to make do in practicing with a glove for left-handed throwers. Due to discomfort with the glove, Lyman began a habit of making basket catches, which continued into his major league career. He attended San Fernando Valley State College, which is now California State University Northridge. He chose not to play baseball in his first two years of college, being involved, instead, in student activism. Following college, Lyman spent three years in the minor leagues before making his major league debut with the Twins on April 8, 1975. Renowned as a fine defensive center fielder, Bostock would have three great seasons with Minnesota, including two top five batting title finishes and a cycle on July 24, 1976. On May 25, 1977, Bostock tied a single-game mark for putouts by 
play an outfielder, with 12 in the second game of a doubleheader versus the Red Sox. After Lyman's brief beginning with Minnesota, he became one of baseball's early big money free agents, signing a six-year deal with the California Angels for $2.25 million. After a disappointing first month with the team, he met with management and tried to return his first month salary. Management refused, and instead of accepting it, he chose to donate the money to charity. Lyman Bostock's career ended tragically on September 27, 1978. Following an away game at Comiskey Park, the 27-year-old went to nearby Gary, Indiana to visit both his uncle and an old friend named Joan Hawkins. Joan introduced Lyman to her sister, Barbara Smith. While driving with these people, Lyman was caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Leonard Smith, Barbara's estranged husband, pulled beside their vehicle and fatally shot Lyman. Bostock's death was met with devastation in the baseball world. In a eulogy for his fallen teammate, Angels pitcher Ken Brett said, We called him Jibber Jabber because he enlivened every clubhouse scene, chasing tension, drawing laughter in the darkest hour of defeat. When winning wasn't in the plan, Lyman knew the sun would come up the next morning. There's only one consolation, we're all better persons for having him touch our lives. In his four-year career, Bostock was a 311 hitter with a 988 fielding percentage in the outfield. Addie Joss's brief major league career was marked with significant triumph. Born April 12, 1880 in Woodland, Wisconsin, Addie had finished high school by age 16 and attended St. Mary's College where he played baseball. As a pitcher, Joss featured an extremely effective fastball and curveball with a most unique delivery in which he could hide the ball until the very last moment. Joss would work through the minor leagues and eventually land with Cleveland in 1902. He made his big league debut on April 26th throwing a one-hitter against the St. Louis Browns. The only hit of the game was a fly ball to right field that the home plate umpire ruled was not caught cleanly. Witnesses at the game, however, say that it never touched the ground. In his rookie campaign, Joss led the American League with five shutouts. From that point on, the human hairpin, as he was known to be called, established himself as one of the strongest pitchers in a decade that included the primes of Cy Young, Christy Mathewson, and Ed Walsh. In his career, Addy never finished finished a season with an ERA over 2.77. He compiled four 20-win seasons and had two full seasons in which he gave up no home runs. The Hairpins career 0.968 whip remains the best in Major League history among qualified pitchers. Joss also authored one of the earliest perfect games in Major League history on October 2nd, 1908, in a tight pitching duel against Ed Walsh. He needed only 74 pitches to complete his gem, the lowest known pitch count in any perfecto. He finished that year with 24 wins, 9 shutouts, and a league leading 1.16 ERA. Modern statistics are very favorable to Joss. In 1908, he had a 204 ERA plus, 0.806 whip, and 1.68 FIP. In his last season, Joss would throw a second no hitter, becoming the first player to no hit the same team twice. Outside of baseball, Addy pursued interests in the fields of journalism and engineering. After being high Hired on as a columnist for a Toledo newspaper, a special phone line had to be installed in the paper's office to field the large volume of calls from fans. In the 1908-1909 offseason, Joss's engineering interests led him to develop an electric scoreboard that would later be known as the Joss Indicator. It was installed by the Cleveland Naps, helping fans monitor balls and strikes throughout games. In April 1911, Joss suffered many health complications brought on by a sudden diagnosis of tuberculosis. He died on April 14th, two days after his 31st birthday. Joss, well liked by his peers and baseball fans, was celebrated. On July 24th, 1911, a benefit game was played for Addy's family. In what is regarded as the first All-Star game, the Cleveland Naps invited players from other American League clubs to play against them, including stars like Home Run Baker, Ty Cobb, Tris Speaker, and Walter Johnson. The game was attended by more than 15,000 fans and raised $13,000. Despite not playing in 10 regular seasons, Hall of Fame rules were waived for Joss, who was eventually inducted by the Veterans Committee in 1978. He is the only major leaguer in the Hall of Fame whose regular season playing career lasted less than 10 years. Considered to be one of the best, if not the best, 
players in the Negro Leagues, catcher Josh Gibson is fabled to have hit 800 home runs in his career, although this number cannot be substantiated. Those who saw him play called him the Black Babe Ruth. Some even referred to Ruth as the White Josh Gibson. Born December 21st, 1911, Josh Gibson's first experience on an organized baseball team did not come until he was 16 years old. Later, according to legend, he became a professional by accident while sitting in the stands. On July 25th, 1930, the Negro League Homestead Grays invited Josh onto the field after their catcher had injured his hand. He remained on the team for the rest of the season. It may be an apocryphal story, but this account is one of the more popular of how Gibson stepped onto the Negro League scene. Negro League teams were known to play in small towns and large cities against varying levels of competition, from other top-tier black teams to semi-professional teams. These differences in competition, as well as a lack of verifiable statistics, leave a modern historian ogling at incredible feats such as a 467 batting average in 1933 and 69 home runs in 1934. Tall tales were shared about Gibson's prowess. One story tells of him hitting a 580-foot home run out of Yankee Stadium. Another tells of a bizarre walk-off home run he hit in Pittsburgh. His home run traveled so far that it disappeared out of sight. The next day, the same two teams were playing in Washington. Just as the players take the field, a ball comes falling out of the sky, and a Washington outfielder grabs it. The umpire looks at Josh and says, You're out! in Pittsburgh yesterday. Baseball great Buck O'Neill said that Josh Gibson, Babe Ruth, and Bo Jackson were the only players who created a sound like dynamite when hitting the ball. On January 1st, 1943, Gibson fell into a coma and was ultimately diagnosed with a brain tumor. After regaining consciousness, he refused the option of surgical removal and lived the next four years with constant headaches. He eventually died of a stroke in 1947 at the age of 35. In 1970, in 1972, Gibson and fellow Negro Leaguer Buck Leonard became the second and third players after Satchel Paige to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame based on their careers in the Negro Leagues. One of only 12 major leaguers born in the Netherlands, Greg Hallman was an outfielder who played in 2010 and 2011 with the Seattle Mariners. Hallman, who could speak four languages, played a total of 44 games with Seattle, hitting two home runs. Prior to his big league career, Hallman enjoyed time representing his home country in competition. He won a gold medal with the Netherlands national baseball team in the 2007 European Baseball Classic. He also played in the 2009 World Baseball Classic. On November 21st, 2011, Hallman was stabbed and killed by his brother Jason at the age of 24. He was buried in his home country in a small grove near the sea, an area chosen because it reminded his family of a baseball diamond. Corey Lytle was born in Hollywood, California on March 22, 1972. A descendant of Robert Fulton, inventor of the steamboat, Lytle enjoyed a nine-year pitching career with seven teams, including a two-year stint with the Moneyball A's of the early 2000s. It was with the A's that he earned his nickname, Snacks, due to his love of consuming junk food in the bullpen. In 2002, Lytle surrendered only one run the entire month of August, setting an Oakland A's record for consecutive innings pitched with out an earned run. Corey spent time with a few other winning teams before landing with the Yankees. In Game 4 of the 2006 ALDS, he made his final pitching appearance as his team was eliminated from the playoffs. Just four days after this, Lytle, who was piloting a small aircraft, died when the plane crashed in New York's Upper East Side. Lytle and his co-pilot were the only fatalities of the accident. A moment of silence was held before the first NLCS game in New York. Yankees owner George Steinbrenner offered condolences to Lytle's widowed wife and child. In 2007, the Yankees wore black armbands to honor their fallen teammate. Willard Hirschberger's tale is one warning of the severity of mental illness. Born in 1910, the Californian played in parts of three successful Cincinnati Reds teams from 1938 to 1940 as a catcher. Willard, nicknamed Bill or Hershey, got to play in the 1939 World Series versus the Yankees, having a two-out, game-tying, pinch-hit single late in Game 4. Throughout his career, Hirschberger was prone to being moody and hard on himself. In August of 1940, Hirschberger 
harshly blamed himself for recent games the Reds had lost. On August 2nd of that year, Hershey had revealed to his manager, Bill McKechnie, personal problems he was dealing with and that he was contemplating suicide. After talking for hours, the two went out to dinner, and Bill appeared to be in better spirits. McKechnie went to bed that night believing he had just saved a life. The next day, after failing to show up to a doubleheader in Boston, Hershberger was found dead from suicide in his hotel room. It was after the doubleheader that McKechnie gave the news to a heartbroken team. He told them a little about the conversation he had with Willard the previous night, but kept other details private. He told his club that they would honor Bill and win the World Series for Hershey. They did just that. Hershberger's number 5 was retired for the rest of the season, and Cincinnati would beat the Tigers in a hard-fought 7-game World Series. The players decided to share a portion of the championship money with Willard's mother, Maude. One of the first MLB players born in the 1990s, Tyler Skaggs was a first round draft pick for the Angels in the 2009 MLB draft. He made his major league debut in 2012 as a starting pitcher for the Diamondbacks, but rejoined the Angels organization in 2014. Tyler's arsenal of pitches featured a low 90s fastball, a changeup, and a curve, which scouts regarded as his best pitch. On July 1st, 2019, while the Angels were on the road in Texas, Skaggs was found dead in his hotel room. He died from vomit asphyxiation after heavy use of opioids and alcohol. Tyler's death was met with heavy grief throughout the baseball world. Fellow draftee Patrick Corbin wore Skaggs as number 45 the day after his death. At the All-Star Game in Cleveland, players wore patches honoring Skaggs, with teammates Mike Trout and Tommy LaStella wearing his jersey number at the game. At the Angels' first home game following Tyler's death, his mother Debbie threw out the ceremonial first pitch, and every Angels player wore his jersey. That night, his team put on a stellar show in his memory, throwing a combined no-hitter against the Mariners, the first combined no-hitter thrown in California since July 13, 1991, Skaggs' birthday. During Players Weekend, players wore patches with Skaggs' number, with a handful of stars wearing nicknames that honored him. The Angels sported Tyler's patch the rest of the 2019 season. The 1962 National League Rookie of the Year, Ken Hobbs left a significant legacy that is still honored today. Born December 23, 1941 in Southern California, Hubs grew up the second oldest of five brothers. When he was only a few months old, a doctor told Ken's family that he would not be able to do things that other kids could do in sports after he suffered a ruptured hernia. Hubs, however, would fully heal from this injury and grow up a multi-sport star. He played in the 1954 Little League World Series and could even pitch with both of his arms in high school. Shortly after graduating from Colton High School, Hubs joined the Hubs organization and eventually made his major league debut on September 10, 1961. He got two hits in his first game as a starting second baseman. From his debut, his career would only go up. In 1962, Hubs led all National League rookies in games, hits, doubles, runs, and batting average. He became the second straight Cubs player to be named Rookie of the Year, after Billy Williams won it the previous season. A terrific fielder, Hubs set major league records by going 78 games and 418 chances without an error. He became the first rookie to ever win a Gold Glove Award, and his 1962 glove remains on display at the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Known for his strong Mormon faith, Hubs would routinely go to church, visit children in hospitals, and help his teammates. In the 1963 to 1964 offseason, Hubs took on a fear of flying by becoming a pilot himself. On February 13, 1964, Hubs and a friend were flying in Provo, Utah when severe weather interfered and the plane crashed. Both Hubs and his friend died. Hubs' funeral was held in his hometown of Colton, California. More than 2,000 people attended his services, including fellow Cubs teammates. In his memory, the Ken Hubs Foundation was established, which which honors outstanding senior athletes from high schools in the San Bernardino area. It still exists today. Born in Cleveland, Ohio, Elmer Gideon has a tale that includes college athlete stardom, a major league stint, and wartime heroics.
the nephew of Joe Gideon, who helped conspire the famous fix in the 1919 Black Sox World Series, Elmer grew up to attend the University of Michigan, where he was a multi-sport star. Although he received varsity letters in football and baseball, Elmer's track and field career was perhaps his best. In hurdles, Gideon set records and earned two Big Ten titles. Despite a shot at competing with the USA's Olympic team, Elmer decided to pursue a career in baseball, signing with the Washington Senators after graduating. He played five games as an outfielder in 1939, the only five games of his big league career. Gideon spent most of the 1940 season in the minor leagues, but was called back up in September to no in-game appearances. In 1941, Elmer was drafted into the military and earned his pilot's wings one year later. He was awarded the Soldier's Medal for Heroism and Bravery after rescuing a crew member from a crash in North Carolina, despite being injured himself. After a lengthy recovery, Gideon joked with his cousin. He said he had used up all of his bad luck and that he would have smooth flying from now on. The Associated Press ran a feature story about Elmer's wartime efforts in which he expressed interest in returning to baseball following the war. In spring of 1944, Gideon was flying on a special mission over occupied France when his plane was shot down. He and five other crew members died. Elmer's remains were returned to the United States and interred at the Arlington National Cemetery. Of the more than five 500 then active major leaguers who served in the military during World War II, only Elmer Gideon and Harry O'Neill, a catcher for the athletics, were killed in combat. After the war, a scholarship and Gideon's name was established at the University of Michigan. One of the most accomplished players in baseball history, the legacy of Roberto Clemente extends far beyond the foul lines. Clemente was born on August 18, 1934, in Puerto Rico, the youngest of seven kids. While in high school, Roberto was a track and field star and Olympic hopeful before deciding to fully commit to baseball. Originally signing with the Brooklyn Dodgers, Clemente's talents caught the attention of the Pirates, who took him as a Rule 5 draft pick in 1954. Roberto came on to the Major League scene in 1955. For all but the first six weeks of his career, he wore his indelible number 21. In response to racial tensions he experienced coming up to the majors, Clemente stated that he didn't believe in color and was taught to never discriminate because of ethnicity. Despite varying successes in his first few seasons, Clemente cemented himself as the Pirates' full-time right fielder. By 1960, he had become one of the most consistent and feared hitters in all of baseball. In that decade, Clemente won four batting titles and compiled more hits than any other player. In 1966, Clemente was named National League MVP after slashing 317, 360, 536, with a career high in home runs, RBIs, and runs scored. Widely esteemed as having the best outfield arm of all time, Clemente won 12 consecutive Gold Glove Awards from 1961 to 1972. Roberto also made 15 All-Star appearances, hitting a walk-off single in one of them. One of the most clutch competitors of all time, Clemente batted safely in every World Series game he played in, and helped the Pirates to two titles in his career. He even earned World Series MVP honors in 1971, after slashing 414, 452, 759. As mentioned earlier, Clemente's legacy extends far beyond the baseball field. Not only did he commit to his country as a Marine Corps reserve for six years, but he also worked tirelessly to promote accessibility and equality to Latin Americans both within baseball and outside of it. He hosted baseball clinics for underprivileged youth free of charge. During his off-seasons, he was heavily involved in charity work in Latin American and Caribbean countries, often delivering baseball equipment and food to those in need. Roberto's significant impact and dedication to the United States and other countries was not overlooked by fans. On July 24, 1970, the Pirates held Roberto Clemente Night. On this eventful evening, many Puerto Rican fans gathered at the new Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh, sporting traditional country attire while cheering on their native hero. A ceremony was held to honor Roberto, and upon his request, several thousand dollars were donated to charity. 1972 would be Clemente's final season. In his last regular season at bat, he hit a double to left center to become the 11th member of the 3,000 hit club. Nicaraguan officials in Miami today issued an urgent appeal for blood donors. They said there's an immediate need for 20 to 25 thousand pints of whole blood for the victims of Saturday's earthquake in Managua. 
Other relief supplies are on their way. The United States sending $3 million in food, medicine, tents, purification equipment, and other aid. On December 23, 1972, the country of Nicaragua was met with a devastating earthquake, leaving thousands dead and even more injured and displaced. On New Year's Eve, Clemente accompanied a plane delivering relief aid to those affected. It crashed into the Atlantic. All but one member of the Pirates attended Roberto's memorial service. The only teammate who did not attend was close friend Manny Sanguian. He instead chose to dive into the Atlantic himself to try to find his fallen friend. Clemente's body was never found. On March 20th, 1973, the baseball writers held a special Hall of Fame election, voting to waive the normal waiting period for retired players. Roberto Clemente was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame posthumously with 92.7% of the vote. Roberto was also posthumously awarded with three civilian awards by the United States government, including the first Presidential Citizens Medal. Clemente's number 21 was retired by the Pirates in 1973. PNC Park Park, the Pirates' current home ballpark, features a right field wall that rises 21 feet to commemorate their legendary player. Since his passing, Major League Baseball has annually given the Roberto Clemente Award to a player with outstanding playing skills and personal work in the community. Leaves from the vine Falling so slow Like fragile tiny shells Drifting in the foam Little soul Come hunting home Great soldier boy Comes marching home 